Today's workshop is a grad track workshop. Know before you go. My name is Kristen Hefner. I'm a user experience librarian here at Evans Library. So this workshop is intended to help you get started on your graduate studies at Florida Tech. The library wants you wants to make sure you know about the wide variety of resources that are available to you, many of which will help save you time, money, and headaches as you move forward in your graduate career. So tonight, today, we're going to discuss where you can find different library services and what some of those services are. We will help you identify who your library liaison is, and if you don't already know, um, if you didn't already know, but also how to find resources specifically for your field. We're going to discuss some of the writing and publishing tools provided through the library, some that are freely available. And finally, we're going to review the assistance that's available to you for thesis and dissertations. So your first stop when doing research should be the library's website, lib.fit.edu. This is where you can access books, articles, research guides, and a lot more. The library is kind of your best way in to access this information. If you're trying to search for it elsewhere uh, on Google or through another search engine, uh, you may hit paywalls. So you may find the article you're looking for, but to be able to read it, it's going to say, hey, this will cost you 40 bucks. And you may already have access to it through the library. So when you're looking for something, make sure you're starting with us first. Also, if you're looking for something we don't have, we can probably get it for you through our interlibrary loan services, which we'll discuss a little in a few minutes. Um, so the website is also home to a lot of other useful tools as well. So first thing we're gonna talk about are, is probably one of the most familiar kind of library resources, which is searching for books, articles, um, things like that. So the way you get started is on the library's homepage, that search bar. So you'll see it on your screen here. That's just is our one search search. It's going to search across our physical collection as well as most of our databases. Not everything is in there. So if you don't find it right there, you may, it doesn't necessarily mean we don't have it. It just means you may have to directly go into certain databases. Um, so when you put in a search, it's going to come up with a search result similar to the page you're seeing on your screen. For something like this, I searched behavior analysis and practice. It gave me over 6 million results. So the first ones are gonna be my most relevant. So this particular search term is actually the name of a journal. So those are my first results. It's also going to give me journal articles. There are some books in there. Now, if I was actually using this as my keyword search, not for this particular journal, I could do some limiters on the left hand side to make my results a little bit more relevant. So perhaps I only want things that were written in the last 15 years. I could change my publication date. I could limit to full text, which is also a limiter on that left hand side to make sure that the things I am finding are full text, not just abstracts or citations. I can also limit it to scholarly or peer re reviewed journals because I don't need that things that are in like popular print or in a book. I need specifically peer reviewed journals for what I'm looking for today. So there's a lot of different ways to limit things on the side. Also at the top, you could click that advanced search and add in more search topics. If like with this one, I got so many results and I needed to narrow my focus a little bit more, I could go into those advanced search to add more terms or to say include this and not something else. So there are some other ways to refine that to get what you've done. Now, one of the tips I'm going to kind of give you is if you were looking for this journal, was that first result, which had the little light bulb next to it, that is going to give you the option you could put in a keyword you were looking for or the name of an author or the title of the article you were looking for and you could try searching directly within that particular journal 
and seeing if your results will come up that way. But what's it? If you're not really sure, but you wanted to browse this particular journal, I would click on the name of the journal and get a result list like this. Open where it says full text access, and it's going to tell you which of our databases contain what years of that particular journal. So this particular one are kind of similar, but sometimes you'll find that we may have hard copies of this journal going back kind of into historic record. So some we have starting at like the beginning of the turn of the century. So around, you know, 1900, a lot of things we have are from the 40s through about the 80s and 90s. So before we started digitizing everything, so, which depending on what your research is, sometimes you need that earlier when this stuff first started being researched as a basis for what you're building on now. So this is going to show you where the different years are of the journal. Also, sometimes you'll go into a particular database and you can't find what you're looking for in it or whatever reason that particular database happens to be under maintenance at that exact time you're trying to get this article. If you look at this list, it may be available through other services. So you always want to look here because you might, there's usually multiple ways of getting at something. That's kind of one of my big tips for when you're looking at journal records. All right. Now, if you were looking for something that the library doesn't own, back on that journal page, there was also a request through interlibrary loan on the left hand side. If you were looking for years of that journal, we don't own, but also you would see it on something like this where there might be a primary source or a citation that comes up, but isn't something that the Evans Library has access to. You'll see this request through interlibrary loan option. That would let you uh, put in a request for us to get it for you from another library. You may also have searched for a particular journal or book and found that we don't have it. From the library's homepage, there's also an interlibrary loan button on the home bar, which you'll see the little on your screen with the little uh, white truck. If you click on that, it's going to prompt you to an interlibrary loan page, which has a red login to the interlibrary loan services button. And you're going to, from there, be able to fill out a request. It's going to require your tracks account to get in, but then you'll be able to fill out the information to help us get you that request. Um, it can take anywhere from a couple of days to a couple of weeks, depending on where we have to get it from. Um, if it's something kind of rare or you're trying to get a thesis that's not from the US, we may have to request it from overseas and those can sometimes take a while. So do the request. Um, it should say that's been successfully submitted. If we have additional questions, the interlibrary loan librarian will contact you and kind of clear stuff up. So keep an eye out for any emails from them because it may be that your article is ready. It may be that we need a little more information to get you what you're looking for. So maybe instead of looking for a particular article, you know you need to look in a specific database. So on the homepage, you scroll down a little bit, there's this more ways to search button, which has our databases in it. On this list, when you click on that, it opens our A to Z databases. It's going to include all of the databases that the library subscribes to, as well as open access databases. Um, so you can go into the specific one you're looking for. The first time going to this database, you want to enter it through the library. This is going to kind of verify that you are connected to Florida Tech. It's going to have you log in. And then once you've done that, you can bookmark it and use that as a shortcut to search this database in the future. But you want to make sure you're going in through the library um, to prompt those correct sign in because you can't always identify that you belong that there's not always an option to say that, hey, I'm part of Florida Tech and sign in on the, if you go directly into that particular database. Sometimes it works, but it doesn't always. So A to Z, you can look across 
these different databases, they're alphabetical. There's also going to be some things in here that are more resources versus databases. So they're not going to actually give you different uh, journal articles, things like that, but are going to be more of a tool. So we'll talk about a few of those in the future. All right. One thing I want to point out under this more ways to search is also where research guides are. And we'll see those again in a minute. So across the home screen, the search screens and within the reference guides, the research guides, you're going to see this ask a librarian kind of source pop up. This is going to let you reach out and talk directly to one of the librarians here at Evans Library anytime that green kind of available button is on. On the library's homepage under hours, at the bottom we'll show you what the times are for the reference services. So during these times, you'll see that green light. If we briefly had to step away, it might say busy helping someone else be right back. Give them a minute and that should change back to green and you'll be able to chat. If something comes up during those hours where Ask a Librarian is not, not set to chat, you can email us and a librarian will get back to you as soon as they can. Um, you also have the option to text us that'll go through this Ask a Librarian service. So that number is on your screen as well, on the screen as well. It is 321-265-3-ASK. And that will work pretty much the way the chat does. You would just do it on your phone through your text messaging. So library liaisons. Each subject area or college has a library liaison assigned to it. This person is your go-to person for finding assistance, looking for those best resources for that area. So research guides, which as I mentioned before, are on that homepage under more ways to search. When you click on research guides, it's going to take you into this by subject. This is a great way to get started finding the resources in your particular discipline. The research guides were created by the different library liaisons, trying to pull the best resources for that subject. So it's going to be a mix of library databases. Sometimes there'll be books. Sometimes it's going to take you to outside um, websites that are authoritative sources for those particular subject matters. It really depends because each one is sort of defined for that area. So some of the engineerings will link out to the standards for those areas. Um, a lot of them will have information about the particular citation styles that that discipline uses if there's a set one. So there's a lot of different things that are going to be on those guides that vary by the subject matter. It's also, so it's a great place to start exploring your resources. There's also a link to our grad track guide within every subject. And that's going to take you to resources that are specific to your um, at, to your studies as a graduate student. So the grad track guide. So whether you followed that link from underneath subject, or you can also get to the grad track guide if you went into topics and it's listed there, or from the homepage under research support, grad track is one of those options. Within the grad track guide, you're going to find a lot of different resources. Um, so grad track is a library service that's focused on graduate students. Within the guide, you're going to find resources on how to do scholarly research how to do a literature review, um, how to work with data for research, um, information about presenting, about doing thesis and dissertations, and a lot more. So we're trying to assemble things that help you progress both as students and as researchers, as well as growing as professionals in your field. You can also directly get to it with the website that is listed on the screen, and that would take you directly into this particular research guide. One of the tools that's listed on that guide are tutorials and videos. That's going to take you to the Evans Library's YouTube channel, specifically to the GradTrack playlist. Um, the GradTrack playlist has 
a list of all of our different videos that the, the library has sponsored, some given by the librarians, some by outside experts, um, to talk about things that will help you as graduate students. So some are more relevant to your current needs, such as how to complete a, like how to write a literature review. Some are to help you grow as a professional in your field, such as sharpen your skills with professional networking. And this particular um, workshop is on there as well. But you're gonna find a lot of different things. And every time we do something, we will add it to this list. So it's a growing kind of list of tutorials and videos. When we find that something's kind of gotten outdated, that's when we'll probably offer that course again. But we usually try to offer different things so that rather than if you could choose something from this list and do it at your own time and your own pace, we want to make sure what we're offering to you live in the library is something that you can't already find from us. All right, the scholarship repository is a place that Florida Tech provides access permanent open access to journal articles, research reports, conference papers, data sets, thesis and dissertations, and other scholarly works created by the Florida Tech faculty and students. So the repository is an archive of the digital assets of the archives, as well as other organizations affiliated with our special collections. Um, to get into the scholarship repository, besides being a thesis or dissertation completed by our Florida Tech students, um, it usually has to have been published in an open access journal and has to be kind of sort of submitted to us by the professors in the, or graduate students who created them. So while the librarians create some alerts, so we know when some of the faculty publish things, as a graduate student, if you publish something, if it's not co-authored by one of the school's faculty, we may not know that you've done that. So if it is published in an open access journal, you may be able to also have it hosted here as part of our scholarship repository. It's also a good place to go if you're searching for recent thesis or dissertations written by students in your particular college. So under the recent submissions, these are going to take me to journal articles um, and other conference proceedings, things like that, that have been submitted to us by uh, faculty and graduate students. I could have, when I searched in the front page, instead of going into a particular college, I could have gone into the thesis and dissertation collection and specifically looked at that to have seen recent submissions. Um, of thesis and dissertations within my college to see what ones most apply to me. The grad track study room, which is room 401, so fourth floor, to get, it has an access code to unlock the key panel. To get the code, you stop at the iDesk with your student ID that identifies you as a graduate student. Um, and you will be able to get the code and kind of explain how the little key box works, um, and then have access to that room. So it's a kind of quiet study space. While you can work in small groups, it is because it is on the fourth floor, which is the library silent floor. The volume needs to be kept down and kept pretty quiet up there. There's also a computer in the room that has some analysis software. So as you're at analyzing your data, there is a computer in there. I know it's got Creo and I think MATLAB, it will have a few different, um, some of the data analysis software. So if you pop in there and sign in using your Drax account, you can see what um, software is available on that computer. Some of it's software that's available in the DSL um, on the second floor, but graduate students had asked for a computer somewhere where they would be able to access it and not have to necessarily be surrounded by the undergraduates or during busy times of the year where the undergraduates have, are heavily using the DSL computers where there might still be a computer available to them. All right. 
So we've talked about a lot of the more traditional tools the library has available. Now we're gonna shift our focus to tools for helping you with writing and publishing. So as a graduate student, many of you are going to be expected to work on a thesis or dissertation and potentially publish your research in journals or present at conferences. The next group of tools are gonna to help hopefully make this process a little bit easier. So let's discuss some options for writing resources. So the first one is the Grammarly Premium, which is super helpful and one I use all the time. So while there is a free edition of Grammarly available, the premium version offers a lot more options. So you can download Grammarly to work on your desktop with Word and other Microsoft Office products. There's also a Chrome plugin that will help you um, use these tools within the browser, as well as a Grammarly website where you can put text directly into it to have it checked. So it goes beyond kind of spelling, grammar, and punctuation checks. And the premium will also help you with word choice, with tone, with fluency, with plagiarism detection. Um, you can sign up through the database page I showed you earlier um, to access the premium version. It has sort of instructions on what you need to do to sign up for an account. So the tone and things um, are going to help as you progress through your graduate studies. So the tone you're using to write an email to a professor might be very different than the tone you're using on a email you're sending out to the students to try to get them to participate in the study that you're doing. So tone really can depend on the audience that you're working on. The academic tone that you're using for writing your thesis or dissertation, again, is going to be very different than in an email or something that's more conversational. So this is a way to help you age that a little bit, as well as just kind of keep your writing clean. Now, academic writer, is super useful if you're in a field that uses APA as your style guide. Um, AP, especially if APA is new to you, this tool has a lot of built-in features to help you um, write within that style, uh, format your citations, format your bibliographies so that you can get it all kind of right within that style. So academic writer is a tool developed by the APA as an authoritative solution for writing and using APA style. It has detailed guidance in their writing center, and it's an excellent tool for guiding you through writing academic papers in the APA style. Um, because of the size and other style requirements for your thesis and dissertation, this is probably not the best choice to use for that but will work for smaller papers or when you have questions or issues with certain kind of nuances of APA style. So Turnitin is a service used throughout Florida Tech as a plagiarism check. The library does provide a link to a practice Turnitin Dropbox. Um, the link is on to this course is on the Grad Track Research Guide. We have found that it's especially useful for some of our students for whom English is not their first language as the nuances of paraphrasing and summarizing can sometimes be a little tricky to kind of walk that line, as well as some of our um, native English speakers who just are finding that they have issues with that, especially if you've not done a lot of writing before. So this is a way before you turn the, something in officially that you can just kind of run it through a check. So I recommend if you're not already using a citation manager that you consider starting to use one. So you may say, why? I can just keep track of all this stuff. Well, the citation manager is going to help you organize your research. Within it, you can create folders, manage your citations. It's gonna help you create bibliographies. And with some managers such as the Zotero, you're going to be able to store full text articles. So you're, rather than downloading and keeping all those PDFs trying to be organized on your computer, you can store them within Zotero rather than download it on your computer. So when you want to refer back to that article that you found three months ago, it's still going to be stored there for you versus 
oh, what was the title of that again? And going through all those files, you're going to be able to see full citations within Zotero, and it's going to help you kind of go back into them a little bit. So while the library does not subscribe to a particular citation manager, Zotero is the one that we provide the most support for. It's a free service, and you can find a lot of videos and information regarding Zotero in our research guides. And the next slide will show you kind of some of the videos in particular that we have on Zotero. Um, as I said, you can group your citations within folders, which helps you separate topics. Um, as you work on a thesis or dissertation, separate things by chapter or by a particular assignment project. So you can kind of separate things out so you're only working within things that are relevant to whatever it is you're currently working on. You can then ex export your bibliography directly into your paper. Um, however, there's also a desktop app as well as plugins that lets you do even a little more than that. So with the Zotero desktop app and the connector, makes it the browser connector lets you kind of save things, websites, journal articles, things easily as you find them. But there are also plugins to Zotero you can use within Microsoft Word that will link it directly and make it really easy to insert your in-text citations as well as creating a reference list. So, like I said, we have a lot of Zotero tutorials available to you. Um, this first option here, the Zotero videos on YouTube. So you can pretty much go into YouTube because it's a free open source citation manager. There are a lot of videos out there. A lot of other schools have created them. A lot of people throughout all some from Zotero themselves. There's a lot of resources out there on how to do different things. But the library's also done a few kind of specific uh, workshops on how to use Zotero. So the first two on here are kind of general, learn how to use it, learn how to organize your citations, how to create an account. Um, the grad track workshop specifically, if Zotero is new to you, will walk you through how to save and organize uh, your references, how to add those journal articles. So if you need help doing any of that, we've got this workshop kind of already created for you. And if you watch those and still are having trouble, you can talk to one of the librarians and we'll help you out a little bit more. Um, and this final one was the in-text citations and references with Zotero, kind of the integrating Zotero directly into Word so you can just easily pull from your Zotero citations directly into the Word document that you're writing. All right, you, as you work to develop a professional reputation in your field, you may want to consider signing up for a free ORCID. This digital ID is going to follow you as you continue in your profession, regardless of where you go to school, where you work, if you change your name. When you use this ID, it is a persistent ID that follows you and you have control over what access it has, what information it's showing. So while you use the ORCID site to create the ID, that is mostly to make sure they're all unique identifiers, but you still have actually the control over it and you are the one who allows other organizations to link things to it so it is a thing you have control over rather than the your the school you're currently going to or a school or a business that you work for later it's going to be more tied to you so no matter where you go it kind of comes with you and it's not just a US based thing, it is an international used ID. Also, some grants are now requiring that researchers have an ORCID as part of their grant process. You can use this ID in your like email signature, which as you write and produce content, as you present at conferences, is a way so that other people say they Google you 
get you, not someone else. Um, so, so frequently there's other people, sometimes in our field, sometimes not, who have the same or similar names. This helps tie your work to you and helps people find you. So it's helping you get the recognition for your contributions in your professional work. So you can, again, like I said, sign up for free, the ORCID.org. All right, Oryx Web is a resource that's provided in our database list. And it's going to help you learn more about a journal. So it's the authoritative source for bibliographic and publisher information for more than 300,000 periodicals. So why would you do this? Well, maybe you want to know, is this journal peer reviewed? Is it open access? How often is it published? It's going to let you learn more about a journal before submitting an article for consideration. Or if you're looking to find out if the information in this journal is likely to be considered reliable or peer reviewed, because maybe something, when you looked up this particular article, while it's really relevant to your work, raise some red flags and you want to make sure it really is a reliable and kind of legitimate journal, not a more predatory, predatory journal that as long as someone pays, they can get their research published. So you want to make sure it is a good source. This is a option for being able to do a little digging to know what know a little bit more about that particular resource. All right, so many of you are going to be required to write a thesis or dissertation as part of your degree program. So writing a thesis or dissertation is an enormous task. And many students are find it overwhelming. So the library has information within a couple of different research guides to help you with this process. The grad track guide includes a lot of information, including how to do your literature review, information on research, as well as writing. Um, this particular, your thesis document, whether it's a, a master's thesis or a dissertation, has a lot of particular re formatting requirements. So we wanna make it as easy for you to do this as possible. So the easiest way to do that is to start with one of our thesis templates. So there's the Florida Tech Microsoft Word template, which is the most commonly used one. And as you can see on the screen, it was recently updated. We try to make sure as versions of Word are released that our template is using the most current version that students have available to them as students at Florida Tech. So if you're using an older version on your computer, you may want to consider upgrading. And currently we're using um, Office 365, which is available to all students for free using your Florida Tech ID. So we try to make the template using the most current format. This helps with any kind of processing type errors that when you're kind of compatibility issues you might have when you're using it in different versions. If you're in a discipline or you have an advisor who would prefer that you use LaTeX, we have that as well. So you want to use this template. There are other templates that are out there, but they're usually formatted for another school or are just more general and don't always fit all the requirements and are going to require a little more work on your part to make them fix, fit with what Florida Tech's, the Office of Graduate Programs, is looking for when they do your format checks. As you start working on this and have questions or running into issues, we have the Formatting Your Thesis and Dissertation Tools, Tips, and Troubleshooting Guide that is going to give you a little more information on if you're having problems with your page numbers or some kind of issue with graphics. This is going to break down some of the most commonly found problems that people run into while they're doing their formatting. So biggest takeaway kind of here is use the current template, whether you're using Microsoft Word or if you're using Latex. You want to use the most current template because we try to keep up with any changes that the Office of Graduate Programs has done, as well as making it compatible with the most recent version of the software. 
um, we've run into problems in the past where students kind of, a student who's about to graduate passes on the template that they used. Well, when you use it a couple of years later, it may not work quite the way anticipated. And it's sometimes caused, it has some built-in formatting issues that are harder to fix. Whereas if you start with the current template, it's much more likely to still be accurate as you finish writing. Once you've written, reached the point where you're writing and working on your formatting and getting ready to submit your thesis, another librarian or I can help you with any of the formatting issues that you run into. So finally, you've gotten your thesis or dissertation written. It's all formatted correctly. You have passed your defense. Your final step is submitting your thesis or dissertation electronically. So we've got step-by-step -step instructions for how this works. So your document will have to be saved as a PDFA. We have instructions showing you how to do that. You have to decide how you want to license your document. So the guide will also break down licensing agreements and copyright and talk to you a little bit more about the different options. So this step-by-step -step guide for submitting is going to walk you through each of the steps that it's going to ask you to do as you submit this to the, ele to the electronic thesis dissertation submission process. So I recommend looking at it and working on going through here as you try to do that. But if you still need help, you're always welcome to talk to any of the librarians for more information. So we talked a lot briefly about a bunch of different topics today. So I want to kind of hit real quick things I want you to have walked away from by having viewed this. So the first is that reference guides are your friends. They cover a lot of different topics. They help get you started and are available pretty much 24 seven. So even when a librarian isn't available or the library isn't open, if you get stuck, this may be a way to help you find out what you need to know versus you, A, wasting a lot of time digging around or putting something on hold until you can reach one of us. Um, a lot of you work on things late at night, during holiday breaks, and during other times where you might not be able to catch one of the librarians. So the research, the reference guides or research guides are going to be a tool that you can get to to kind of help hopefully get you over a stumbling block that you hit. Also, take advantage of the variety of resources the library offers. So we've got all these different databases. We've got the tools like Grammarly. We're trying to help make, provide services that help improve your education and make your process, your education process, the thesis writing process all a little bit easier. Um, use the thesis and dissertation template. It really will save a lot of headache in the long run. Because as much as you may feel like, oh, I can, I know how to use Word, I can do this. The very specific requirements of the thesis and dissertation process are much more complicated than you might realize. And there's a lot of things that by using the template, will make your life easier because it's already built in how to auto populate your table of contents, how to, when you add figures, generate your list of figures so that you're not having to manually create those things. And when you make changes, it will automatically update them. So there are reasons why we did this template other than just trying to make them all look the same. It is trying to make your writing process a little bit easier. And finally, all of us at the library really want to help you succeed and want to work with you to make sure that happens. So if you have any kind of questions, just ask and we will, if we don't know the answer, try to find out the best person, place, or way to find you that information. All right, so thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, you're welcome to email me. My name again is Kristen Hufford. And my email is there listed on the screen. So thank you.